this morning, I got up, opened up my YouTube channel, uh, and I saw that there was a uh, an atheist who has a channel also on YouTube. What a coincidence. I'm an atheist who has a channel also on YouTube. Who is now taking my videos one at a time and, and basically trying to deconstruct every video. Now, I'm not a big time detective who's been on TV, but it seems like he could be talking about me. And that has become the content on his YouTube channel. Okay. It's not my whole channel, but I do have a pretty good playlist going. I don't typically engage those folks, but I do learn from those folks. Well, I'm sorry to hear that you won't engage because I'd love to talk to you sometime. But I am pleased to hear that you'll be listening to learn, because everyone has room for improvement. Welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. If you're new to the channel, take a second to tap on the subscribe button, so that you'll be notified when new science, theology, and news videos come out. Today, Cold Case Detective J. Warner Wallace is going to let us know why naturalistic explanations for the resurrection of Jesus are lame. 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 So lame. So lame. Pretty lame. What is it that's keeping you from thinking that this is a reasonable inference? Because look, I've looked at, what we do in any crime scene is a called abductive reasoning, right? We go to death scenes, we're not sure what we have here. Is it a suicide, a homicide? Is it a natural death? Is it an accidental? You've got to figure those things out. That's good to hear. When it is discovered that someone has died, there are a number of potential explanations. Suicide, natural causes, accident, or murder. You have to figure these things out by seeking more information to help you narrow down the options. But until you have sufficient information, all the options should still be considered. At least I hope so. And if it's not a, a homicide, if it's a suicide, an accidental, or a natural, we get to go home. So we would prefer it to be one of those two things. Okay? Right. We would actually love it to be not a homicide. I guess that makes sense. But you seem to be setting up some kind of potential confirmation bias scenario where your personal preference might influence your conclusion. I don't think that's what you want to do in your analogy. And I sure hope it's not what you do at your job. I think we have to at least agree on a couple of things. Number one, it's ludicrous to think that Jesus never lived. We've got more than enough uh, historical evidence to demonstrate that Jesus lived. I don't know about ludicrous, but despite the inevitable fresh round of disapproving comments from my mythicist friends, I'm going to grant you this for the sake of discussion, Jim. Jesus existed. He lived. Fact one. Now the question is, well, is the tomb empty? I think the tomb is empty. I don't think the tomb is empty. I've made a number of videos about just that. So we don't need to get into it here, but no. And you'd be very hard pressed to find a secular historian who thinks there was an empty tomb. Now the, what I see Bart Ehrman doing is he always believed the tomb was empty. But then he wrote a book called How Jesus Became God in which he shifted his thinking on this. And he says, no, no, I probably didn't put them in a tomb. Back in 2003, renowned biblical scholar Bart Ehrman gave this lecture for The Learning Company, which is often quoted to this day. And so I think we can say that after Jesus' death, with some, probably with some certainty, that he was buried, possibly by this fellow Joseph of Arimathea. In order to juxtapose it with this statement in Dr. Ehrman's debate three years later with Dr. William Lane Craig. The payoff is this. We don't know if Jesus was buried by Joseph of Arimathea. What we have are gospel stories written decades later by people who had heard stories in circulation, and it's not hard at all to imagine somebody coming up with a story. We don't know if his tomb was empty three days later. We don't know if he was physically seen by his followers afterwards. Bill's going to come up here and tell me now that I've contradicted myself, but I want to point out that earlier he praised me for changing my mind. <laughs> All the while ignoring the bulk of the earlier 2003 position, which affirms his longtime skepticism of the accounts we have. There's nothing completely implausible about that except to say that Romans, as a rule, did not allow crucified people to be given proper burial. It may be that in this case uh, an exception was made, although some scholars have suggested in recent times that this story about Joseph of Arimathea burying Jesus is not historically factual, that it was a later uh, tradition that Christians came up with to explain how it is that Jesus 
in three days left an empty tomb. In order to have the account of Jesus uh, leaving behind an empty tomb, you obviously have to have him put into a tomb, and so you have to have some story that explains how it is he got put into a tomb when everybody knows the crucified people normally were not put into a tomb. Some scholars have argued that it's more plausible that, in fact, Jesus was placed in a, uh, in a common burial plot, which sometimes happened, or was, as many other crucified people, simply left to, uh, to be uh, eaten by scavenging animals, which also happened commonly uh, uh, for crucified persons in the Roman Empire. In 2012, Dr. Ehrman was asked on his blog, Did you really change your mind? And what led you to change your mind? To which he replied, About seven or eight years ago, I started having doubts about the historicity of Jesus' burial, and as a result, of the empty tomb. So, seven or eight years before 2012 would be around 2004, precisely between his initial lecture and the Dr. Craig debate. So yes, as Dr. Ehrman's career shifted from pure textual criticism to historical pursuits, his confidence in an empty tomb diminished to the point he no longer believed it. Now, Dr. Ehrman was also at one time a devoted conservative Christian, and changed his mind about that. The good Detective Wallace here can't stop talking about how he was once a non-believer, and then changed his mind to become a believer. That someone would change their mind when they learn new information is a virtue, not a vice. I'm not sure why apologists present this case as suspect, What's more important are Dr. Ehrman's reasons for changing his mind. What then really happened to the body of Jesus? We don't really know. My guess is that like others, the two killed with Jesus that day, for example, and others crucified during the same Passover season, Jesus was thrown into a common tomb where he experienced corruption like everyone else, so that within days he was no longer even recognizable. It's a guess but it's more historically plausible than the idea that the Romans would allow a decent burial. Because now his theory is, well, if, if, if one person has this kind of a hallucination because they're so convinced, and they're in a position of, of authority or influence, they could influence a whole group that they saw the risen Christ, even to the point where the other group thinks they're seeing the risen Christ. Okay, that's another theory. Sounds a little like mine that we can attribute all of pre-Pauline Christianity to a bereavement hallucination by Peter. Good. Line up all your theories on how it is you're going to explain what we have evidentially, which is that people were willing to die for their claims, claimed he rose from the dead, wrote scripture very early. There was apparently no body that was ever recovered, whether it's in the tomb or not. And we know that Jesus lived and was crucified. So explain to me how we, what, what is it your theory will do? This isn't the worst lists of minimal facts I've seen. Just a few adjustments needed. Let's go in reverse order. I've stipulated the living and dying. It's the most boring claim about a person in history you can make. Everyone who lived also died. Dr. Ehrman already went through the body recovery thing. Most crucifixion victims were left on the cross to rot and to be eaten by animals. Or tossed into mass graves to rot. Either way, one couldn't go back and retrieve it. Consensus is that the Gospels were written 40 to 70 years after the death of Jesus. Jim can call that early if he likes, but it's a full first century lifetime after the events. To imagine that 40 years, or even 20 years, 10 years, 1 year, is some kind of guarantee of accuracy is just silly. Just check your social media feed about whatever happened in the world yesterday. And that people were willing to die for their claims... Well, as Wallace will admit, martyrs and terrorists give up their lives for firmly held beliefs every day. But this isn't interesting or compelling unless we're talking about first-hand witnesses. What Wallace cannot produce is evidence that first-hand witnesses were willing to die. See my extensive discussions with Dr. Sean McDowell on this topic if you want to hear more. And the reason why there are six or seven non-christian theories and then the one christian theory there's only one one there's not like eight christian theories by the way there's a bunch of non-christian theories anytime you see someone come at you this way and i see this in defense attorneys all the time they'll say there's like here's like eight other ways you could explain this well guess what it's, why do you have eight why not just one why not just one what was it that jim said earlier in the stream 
right? You go to death scenes, we're not sure what we have here. Is it a suicide, a homicide? Is it a natural death? Is it an accidental? You got to figure those things out. It's okay to have multiple possibilities at your crime scene. But on history, this is some kind of weakness. Right. All these guys don't agree with each other. Right. They got their own theory. If there are multiple theories that fit the evidence, then the intellectually honest thing to do is to acknowledge that there are multiple theories that fit the evidence. We wait until there is sufficient evidence to narrow it down to one single theory. There's a reason that cold cases exist, Mr. Cold Case Detective. Because sometimes there isn't enough evidence to conclusively convict one person. You, better than most, should know we don't have enough information to know what happened is often the harsh reality. And they think the other guy's theories are lame. Well, I, I agree with you there. They're all lame. That is so lame. Lame. What a lame -o. Lame, 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 lame. Okay? Yeah. The better theory, and the only reason why you don't like the Christian theory, the only reason why you don't like the Christian theory is because you don't think a miracle is reasonable. It's not that I think a miracle is unreasonable. I fully believed in miracles when I started investigating this. No, I reject the Christian theory because there is entirely insufficient evidence to warrant a miracle claim, particularly when there are a plethora of entirely mundane explanations that perfectly fit the bill. I would not like to think that a person would tell someone he has a plethora and find out that that person has no idea what it means to have a plethora. You have a presuppositional bias against the miraculous. That's all this is. Jim, you fully believe in miracles and the supernatural. Yet you said that when you investigate a death, your choices are natural causes, accident, suicide, or homicide. Why don't you have miracle on that list? How do you determine that a knife didn't miraculously fly across the room? Or that a ghost didn't stop someone's heart? or that a demon didn't teleport the victim into an open field. You don't have a presuppositional bias against any of those ideas. Do you suggest them to your fellow officers? Or testify to them in court? Oh wait, you'd only suggest such theories if there was sufficient evidence to support the theory. Well then, now we're on the same page. This is about people who say, look, if not for the fact it requires a miracle, I might be in. So you think, that everything in your world can be explained by natural causes and natural forces? I do think that, while we don't yet have every detail mapped, that natural explanations are plausible and sufficient to explain what we see. That doesn't rule out supernatural, if such a thing could even be coherently defined. And when natural causes are sufficient, we don't go seeking unnatural ones. Do you think that everything in your environment, your entire history on, in the universe, could be explained by nothing more than space, time, matter, physics, and chemistry? That's correct. Yes. How do you explain the beginning of the universe? Which you cannot explain using space, time, matter, physics, or chemistry because none of those things are available to you. Well, while the details are debated and probably unknowable, as the concept of before time may well be incoherent, Big Bang cosmology tends to posit something like a singularity. Even pop culture television sitcom theme songs understand this. Our whole universe was in a hot, dense state. If there was a singularity containing the energy of the universe before the universe, then there was also matter, an alternate form of energy. There was also physics and chemistry, since those are merely descriptors of how matter and energy behave. You may ask where the singularity came from, this is the same as asking where God came from. Ultimately, all infinite regressions must terminate in a brute fact. Your brute fact is a God. My brute fact is energy. Since we all agree that energy exists, mine seems the more evidenced hypothesis. But now I'm just asking you, if that thing that caused the Big Bang is personal, not just another impersonal force, its energy surrounds us and binds us. I've yet to hear any compelling reason to insist that the cause for the rapid expansion of existing energy would need to be personal. By the way, force seems to me to imply you have something to act with and rules that act on. But you don't have space, time, matter, physics, or chemistry. Yeah, we have matter, physics, and chemistry, as discussed. We may also have some alternate form of space and time outside of our particular instantiation of space and time. 
that's not currently knowable. So we say we don't know. So I think we're already there. I think I are, most people, if they really think about it clearly, they already believe in something extra natural. I think that most people don't take the time to think about it clearly. And if they did, would come to realize that they can't even articulate what the extra natural would even mean. Okay, now the question is, is it personal? Maybe, but you certainly haven't demonstrated any reason that it would need to be so. And how did this abruptly ending tangent even relate to the resurrection? Somehow our lack of insight into what existed before time, if such a concept is coherent, means that we all believe in miracles? And therefore someone rising from the dead is automatically a more reasonable conclusion than the simple, sufficient, mundane idea that a single person was mistaken, exaggerated, or lying? Is this the kind of logic you use to solve cold cases, detective? Somehow, I don't think so. That said, if you'd like my comprehensive hypothesis on how Christianity probably began, with no resurrection required, click on the thumbnail on the screen and I'll see you over there. I do hope you've learned a few things, Mr. Wallace. Thanks for joining us. Later.